There's a top 100 prospect that we've never discussed on this show. Emmanuel Rodriguez of the Twins. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked On MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, freelance baseball writer and podcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen every single day. We're proudly part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. And today's episode is made possible by our friends at Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. And when you enter promo code locked on MLB, they'll throw in a free gift, a custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every single order. So I've been making a list the last couple weeks of guys that come up in prospect conversations or guys that we've seen in person or noteworthy guys in some shape, form, or fashion that we just have not discussed on this show. And with Baseball America doing their new top 100 list on Wednesday morning, Wednesday, June 7th, they have... Twins outfielder Emmanuel Rodriguez at number 62. And I think it's a really good opportunity to buy low, but it's a top 100 prospect we've never talked about. So let's get into it. Uh, 2019 IFA and has had, has shown a lot of promise, but has not actually played a lot of games because of different injuries. So uh, 2022 is in low A. He got a little bit of time in rookie ball in 21, like 37 games, like a month and a half. But 2022, 47 games in low A Fort Myers. 272, 492, 551. Nine home runs, 17 extra base hits, like at age 19. This is memorable to have that much power performance as a 19-year-old. 57 walks to 52 strikeouts and 11 to 16 on stolen bases. So everybody was really high on Emmanuel Rodriguez, right? He has uh, one, the season, his season ended in early June, right? He had a knee injury, had to have surgery, missed the rest of the year. And then this year he had uh, an abdominal strain. And so he missed like a month. And so we've seen flashes, we've seen promise of stuff, and it hasn't necessarily panned out. When you go back and you look at last year, he walked 28.6% of the time. His on-base percentage was 492. Both of those, any minor league hitter in a full season league, so excluding rookie ball at the complex and excluding the DSL. Uh, Of any minor league hitter that had at least 150 plate appearances, he was number one in walk rate and on base. You combine that with showing nine home runs, 17 extra base hits, and it's like, okay, he's got virtually elite swing decisions and pitch recognition. He's got visible, like already showing power. That combines to give you a like a cleanup hitter type, number three hitter type, who's going to be able to just absolutely destroy it when he gets to the majors. This year has very much been a struggle. He is in high A Cedar Rapids, and he's gotten 31 games because, again, he missed like a month with that abdominal strain. 177, 338, 372 slash line. Six home runs. Nine extra base hits, 27 walks to 53 strikeouts, and five of seven on stolen bases. And there's some interesting quirks to when he's done some of these things. So, like, his last game he played in the month of April was April 15th, because he he was on the injured list the next, like, starting right after that. Three of his six home runs were in those first seven games. The other three home runs, like when he came back on May 6th, he didn't hit his first home run until May 18th. He hit two home runs in like a three-game stretch and then didn't hit another home run until June, until June 1st against Lansing, against the Lug Nuts. And so we've seen good, we've seen bad. The strikeouts, obviously, I, you know, I, I, I mentioned 
what he was able to do last year, the strikeouts, he had 52 strikeouts in 47 games, so more than once a game. That's always a little milestone that we're looking for that's bad, but he walked more than he struck out. So it's a really interesting kind of variance thing here. And one of the reasons that I think the strikeout rate is so high for Emmanuel Rodriguez, it isn't a lack of contact ability. To me, when I watch, and some of the things that stand out, is he is very reluctant to swing the bat. Like, I want to say his end zone swing percentage is something like 2 or 3%. It is very, very low. Extraordinarily low. And so, I think part of the reason he gets such a great grade on pitch recognition and, and the on-base ability is because in low A, so many pitchers can't throw strikes consistently and reliably. And so he can take advantage of that. But when you get him in a little bit of a better league, in this case high A, with guys who are better at throwing strikes consistently and when they need to, he gets in disadvantage counts, he gets behind, then he's required to to start uh, chasing, things like that. Combine that with some, what I've noticed is some some struggles and some issues when he tries to deal with uh, uh, changes in speed. So you can get him with good off speed in the zone. He's sitting fastball. You slip a change up in there. He'll swing and miss at that. And so you combine the, he was rewarded for being extraordinarily patient in low A when he's facing better pitchers in high A who can execute those pitches, he's getting into a disadvantage count. He's getting into a bad situation. Now he has to chase. Now he has to do some of that stuff. And so it, it it's lowered the overall ceiling as far as his production in 2023. Now, obviously, being injured doesn't help either. Uh, and, and we still feel like the power production is great. His average exit velo is like above 90 miles an hour. He still hits the ball hard when he hits it when he makes good contact, when he gets a a strike to swing at and actually does swing. But he's got to work on the approach to be more consistent. And in the last couple days, I feel like we've seen him get a little bit better. Uh, He just finished a series against Lansing, uh, against the Lugnuts. And he went 5-19 with with that one home run I mentioned. Uh, Five RBIs, six walks to seven strikeouts. So still has some of the strikeout issues. But a little more, like swinging the bat a little more often, a little more willing to go out there and go after it. And so because of that, I feel like he's starting to figure it out. And with missing that time, obviously it kind of thro- it kind of throws things off, throws off your schedule there. I will say defensively, I do need to mention it. It's not a, so many people watch this show for fantasy reasons. And if you do, it's a great time to buy low on Emmanuel Rodriguez. I went out and got him in my dynasty league. Uh, but, uh, defensively, he's he's a center fielder for now. His speed's not anything special. It's it's average, maybe a little bit above average. If he continues to physically develop, he's probably going to end up being in a corner. He'll be in right. He'll be an above average defender there. The arm is really good. I think it's a plus arm. So he's got a path to be a power hitting corner outfielder. He just has to get better at actually swinging the bat before he has two strikes. Like. That, that's what he has to work on, is just swing the dang bat. In just a minute, let's talk about Ryan Noda of the Oakland A's and Sterling Thompson of the Colorado Rockies. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Bird Dogs. You have heard me say this before. If you look good, you feel good. When you feel good, you play good. When you play good, they pay good. Bird Dogs does that. These shorts... These khaki shorts, they're not actually khaki. There's, they're this cloud knit fabric that bird dogs like created. They look like khaki, but they stretch. They're, made, they're designed to be slimmer through the thigh and the leg. They let you show off the work you have done in the gym. They fit a lot better, a lot more flexible than a standard khaki, pair of khakis would be. The fabric is like a, a, a sweat wicking anti-stink fabric. So it help, you can wear them all day. Whether it's the golf course, whether it's the ballpark, happy hour, whatever it might be. So they are fantastic. 
I love these shorts. I can't tell you the names, but the names are funny. Trust me on this. So go to birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. Enter promo code locked on MLB. You will get a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's right. They will not only take care of your boys, they will take care of your beverages as well. Birddogs.com slash locked on MLB. Promo code locked on MLB for a free Yeti style tumbler. You will not take these shorts off. Okay, so another guy we've never discussed on this show, and that again, that's on me. We need to do this. Ryan Noda of the Oakland A's has had a really interesting career, was a 15th rounder uh, in 2017 out of the University of Cincinnati by the Toronto Blue Jays. He was moved to the Los Angeles Dodgers. He was the player to be named later in the Ross Stripling deal. So he goes to the Dodgers, and he played very well. He was in... The whole year in Double A Tulsa in 21 after the trade. He spent the whole year last year in Triple A Oklahoma City. Both places played really well, but at the major league level, like especially in 22, you had Freddie Freeman. They did not need him, and so Oakland took him in the Rule 5 draft. Uh, in Tulsa in 21 at age 25, 113 games, 250, 383, 521, 29 home runs, 45 extra base hits. 127 strikeouts also. Just 74 walks to 127 strikeouts. In AAA Oklahoma City in 22, remarkably similar slash line. 259 batting average, so 9 points better. 395 on base, so 12 points better. 474 slugging, that ticked down a little bit. 25 home runs, 49 extra base hits. 92 walks to 162 strikeouts in 135 games. You already kind of have an idea of what he can do here. Oakland takes him in the Rule 5 draft because they're like, okay, this dude obviously has very good pitch recognition, but he also has, you know, a lot of swing and miss. And he's got power production as well. So when you see him this year, 57 games in the majors, some of that stuff has materialized. And some of that has not. The batting average in his 57 games in in Oakland, 242. So that's dropped down a little bit from where he was. On base of 403. His on base keeps getting better the higher up the ladder he goes and the better competition he faces. Slugging of 446. The slugging has dropped down the higher up the ladder he's gone, the more competition he's faced. Six home runs, 19 extra base hits. 39 walks to 68 strikeouts in 57 games, and 2 of 3 on stolen bases. Defensively, he is a good athlete despite being a big boy. I want to say he's something like 6'3", 225. But good athlete for being a big boy. He's a good first baseman. Does really well at picking balls. uh, Has decent range. is, Is a good defensive first baseman. So it's not like a guy where you're trying to squeeze him in and make him work, okay? Offensively, Uh, it is very much like there is swing and miss in here, and it's because it's a longer swing that's kind of stiff. It's not super fluid. It's not, he's having to work at the swing. It's not a naturally smooth and flowing swing. And so that's where the stiffness comes in. That's where the swing and miss comes in. But when he, like, he'll work a count, he'll rack up multiple foul balls here, things like that, get it to a long thing, and then he'll walk. Uh, He is very much a three true outcomes guy, but he has more walks than you would expect from a three true outcomes guy. So obviously it's going to be a home run. It's going to be a walk. It's going to be a strikeout, but the walks are higher than you typically see from a slugger. And at least at the major league level this year, the, uh, the, the power has been lower. It's not for lack of having power. 93rd percentile on max exit below 81st percentile on average exit below. Hard hit percentage of 74, well, hard hard hit percentile, 74th percentile in hard hit. 91st percentile in barrel percentage. When he gets one, he squares that sucker up. Uh, walk rate, 100th percentile in walks. Chase rate, 95th percentile in chase. Like, he is legitimately, at the major league level, a very, very patient uh, and good offensive hitter. But I mentioned the swing and miss, right? At the major league level, first percentile in whiff on StatCast. Fourth percentage in strikeouts. 
Uh, sixth per- like sixth percentile on expected batting average. I mean, it is there is it is amazing how much red and blue is on this stack as profile. He's struck out thirty three point five percent of the time, so that's like bottom five percent. Uh, the the MLB average is twenty two percent this season. He's at thirty three point five, but he's also walked nineteen point four percent of the time. Again, he is as the the top figure in all of baseball, whereas the average in MLB is like 8.4. So very much a three true outcomes guy. I think he can be a piece to build around. Think about the fact that he is 27 this year. He was a rule five selection. So you have him through his age 32 season at either league minimum or arbitration rates. It feels like they're going to be able to build around Ryan Noda. The question's going to be, how well can he smooth out that swing and get and get the power production coming back in there a bit? Because, I mean, what's it? Six home runs from your first baseman is not necessarily a great thing to be super excited about. So let's see if we can work on that a bit. But I like Ryan Noda, and I think he could be a guy for the Oakland A's. No reason to trade him at the trade deadline because, obviously, you've got six... Five years of control after this year, it feels like you could move on from Seth Brown if you wanted. He plays first base, corner outfield. You can move on from Seth Brown and keep Ryan Noda. Another guy I want to talk about, Sterling Thompson of the Colorado Rockies. 2022 first rounder out of the University of Florida. And a little bit of a polarizing prospect because there's questions about how much of this is really him and how much of this is where he plays. So, 37 games this year in low A, he is in Spokane. So, if you know what I'm where I'm going with this, you know, 438, 489, 762 slash line in high A. And this is after he did rookie ball, low A, AFL last year. So, he's got decent experience. But uh, yeah, 438, 49, 762, five home runs, 15 extra base hits, eight walks to eight strikeouts in 21 games. So he's not walking a ton, but he's rarely striking out. Five of six on stolen bases. He played second base and right field in college. They've uh, Last year, he played third base and right field. This year, he's been almost exclusively third base. The arm is plus. Uh, the, the actions are, eh, they're iffy. He may not stick at third, uh, but either way, they're working on it. Here's the thing, though. It's Spokane, right? The park factors here, if if 100 is a perfectly average park, as far as uh, hitter's park versus pitcher's park, the park factor for Spokane on runs is 121. So it's 21% better than your average park. The park factor for home runs is 165. So he's getting a boost from where he plays. And he hasn't been there long enough for them to move him to double A, but he's going to need to go to double A to Hartford to get in a more normal offensive environment to figure out what is real. Because when you watch, like he, he he's a really good hitter. It's a, it's a pure stroke, but I don't think the power is actually as good as a 762 slugging would make it feel. One, he's 22. In high A, he came out of the SEC, and the competition level in the SEC is genuinely considered to be around a double-A level, especially when you look at the pitching and a power program like he was at Florida. So he's probably playing a little bit under what he's done in the past. And then two, he's in Spokane, and this ballpark is known for having just ridiculous offensive numbers. So the swing itself is not actually a power swing. It's very much a line drive swing. Like it's really simple. It's a lot of hands in there. Kind of kind of flat versus a big uppercut. Helps you with zone coverage, right? Uh, you know, it helps you cover more of the zone because your bat's in the zone for longer. It's not a dramatic rake up through the zone. But I feel like he's not going to have this type of home run production, you know, 762 slugging in a different park. And that's why I want to see him in Double A Hartford. He's very good at making quality contact. Don't get me wrong. I like Sterling Thompson. I just don't necessarily think that he is what he appears to be as far as a power hitter. I think he's going to end up. The question is, 
Uh, defensively, does he stick at third? I don't think he does. And so if he doesn't, you're looking at an outfielder. The arm's above average to plus. So he could play either one. The speed's not great. So he could play right. As a average defensive right fielder, he could play left. I think he'd be a little bit better in left. And that arm would really help as far as throwing home, you know, keeping guys from, go, from, uh, from tagging up on a fly ball to deep left field. But either way, I like Sterling Thompson. I just need to see him at a level that has realistic offensive numbers. In just a minute, I've got four quick hitters we're going to do here. Guys that people have asked about that we've never discussed, including two catchers and who may be the actual slowest guy in minor league baseball. And we'll get to that next right here on Locked on MLB Prospects. And we are back. This is the show full of guys that we have never discussed. Uh, I've been promising this show for a while. It's finally here. In the meantime, if you have ideas for a show that you want to see, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball, show's on Twitter at Locked On Farm. You can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com, or drop your questions into Locked On MLB Prospects Discord. Links in the episode description, links in show notes. You can also leave your questions there, because our Monday mailbag is full of nothing but questions from listeners. So, outfitter Roman Anthony, the Boston Red Sox, second round supplemental out of high school last year. And he's got 37 games in low A right now. I believe that is, uh, yes, yeah, Salem. That's right, it's Salem. So 239, 398, 341. One home run, 11 extra base hits, 37 walks to 30 strikeouts, 11 of 17 on stolen bases. He's in a really weird place where the raw power is absurd, but he showed swing and miss in high school. He showed swing and miss in a limited sample uh, you know, limited sample last year, but not bad. He struck out four times in, in, in 10 games, albeit didn't make a ton of contact. He was batting like 189 in those 10 games. And then this year, only batting 239 in the 37 games. So raw power, I mean, 65, maybe 70. But what is the game power going to be? Because how well is he able, like what is the hit tools ceiling? Can he get it to average? I feel like it's below average right now. Can he get it to average? defensively, he's playing center field. I think he may or may not be able to stick. I think he's probably, he's average as far as speed, defense, arm, all of that stuff. Can he, as he physically develops, again, he's age 19, so this is that prime time right now. He's already coming in. He's listed at 6'3", 200. As he adds that next 10 to 20 pounds of weight, is it good weight or bad weight? This is where I think the new CBA for minor leaguers will help because he'll have better nutrition, and I don't understand why teams didn't do this before, especially with prep draftees. Make sure they're eating healthy. Make sure they're, they're on a good workout plan. They're doing all this stuff correctly. Just take care of it because you invested in these guys. But So I'm intrigued by his possibilities. I think he could be a power-hitting corner outfielder down the road if everything goes right, but the worst-case scenario that, again, we're assuming he makes it, that's just the, the assumption here. The worst case scenario is you're looking at a a corner outfielder who doesn't hit for a ton of power and is kind of outside of the archetype of a usual corner outfielder. Shortstop Cesar Pareto from the Baltimore Orioles, 2021 IFA out of Cuba, signed a little bit older than most of uh, than most international free agents do because of the whole Cuba thing. So he he started off uh, last year in High A Aberdeen at age 23. He's now uh, 24 in Double A Bowie. He finished up the year last year there, went back this year. And last year, he was really struggling with that transition to uh, professional pitching and how well they could kind of run, like get pitches on the black and play, you know, play on the edges of the zone. Really struggled with that. They started to get him to to chase a lot more because he had to he had to like learn to lay off those pitches and things like that. So he struggled last year. To us, I'm not going to give you the whole stats, but a slash on of like 255, 296, 348. So they sent him back to Bowie this year, and he's made the adjustments. 47 games so far, 348, 397, 478. Four home runs, 15 extra base hits, 13 walks to 11 strikeouts, three of eight of stolen bases. Defensively, he's playing second, he's playing third. Feels like it's a utility profile. The arm is fine. Nothing's exceptionally amazing at either one. But offensively, the contact skills are there. He's just got to, and you see he's made some improvement, but he's got to continue with The swing decisions, the pitch recognition, understanding sequencing, and how pitchers are trying to attack him. 
I think there is still a cap on his power ceiling. And if there's anything that keeps him from being a major league starter, that's probably what it is. But in the meantime, again, he can play second, he can play third, be a utility guy. It's just a matter of understanding the approaches in professional baseball from the, from the pitchers you're facing and where does the power go or how does the power develop. Uh, two catchers, including the other guy who might be the slowest pitcher, or the slowest position player in baseball. I mentioned Kyle Manzardo is not a very fast guy. Moises Ballesteros of the Chicago Cubs, 2021 IFA. Uh, he's a catcher. He might be the actual slowest player. I'm not quite sure. 44 games in low A this year. 268, 387, 405. Four home runs, 13 extra base hits. 30 walks to 23 strikeouts and 5 of 5 on stolen bases. Really good offense. I like how he can make, like he's got some pop in the bat and he's got it to all fields. He's not just pulling everything. He can hit for both average and power. I think the power is probably a little bit higher than the hit tool, actually. Very patient at the plate. The things to be concerned about, one, he is slow. He is very slow. I do not think he has a career triple. He does have uh, five stolen bases this year, which is wild, but same time, everybody has stolen bases, especially when they make it where you can only pick off one time instead of twice, like at the major league level. And the arm is plus, but because of the body, he's already he's listed at like 240 at like age 19. Uh, he doesn't have great athleticism. And so other than the arm, there's not a lot to keep him behind the plate. The blocking's not great. The agility's not great. He feels like he's going to be a first base or DH guy. Uh, the Baseball America write-up actually compared him to Daniel Vogelbach, which is wild. And so watch as he continues to develop, see what he does conditioning-wise because of the big frame. Uh, but I do like the offensive potential. The question is just where does he play and is he able to contribute on defense at all? Uh, the other guy, Creed Willems of the Baltimore Orioles, 2021 eighth rounder out of high school, has been in both low A and high A this year, just got promoted like a week ago. And so in low A, 30 games, and this is uh, Delmarva, 302, 442, 615. Eight home runs, 14 extra base hits, 20 walks to 29 strikeouts, 2-2 two two on stolen bases. In the six games in high A, Aberdeen, very small sample size, so I'm not worried about the slash line. He's 3 of 18, a home run, scored three runs, has three RBIs, three walks to five strikeouts. Um, defensively, the arm is plus. He was a pitcher at, uh, in, in high school, and so like the arm is very, very good. He's a better athlete than you'd expect for a catcher and based on the size and things like that. He's like 6'1", 230 or so. Uh, the swing is short. But he's got power. He's got pop in there. I feel good about that. And it feels like it's not just pull side power. He can he can hit to all fields. Question's going to be, one, physical development. Two, game calling. Working on that. Something you see a lot with these prep catchers. They don't have a ton of experience calling their own games. And so we need to see him get a little bit better with that. But I like what I've seen so far from Creed Willems. I feel like he could very easily be your number two catcher behind Adley Rutschman in a couple years. Fantastic week this week. One more show coming up. Reminder, you have questions for the show. I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. You've got the, sh uh, the show's on Twitter at Locked on Farm. You can email us, prospects at gmail.com. You can drop it in the Discord if you'd like. In the meantime, remember, it's always a great time to pay a minor leaguer. Oh,